This episode of The Reality Check is brought to you by HelloFresh. Forget takeout. HelloFresh delivers all the ingredients for delicious, healthy meals anyone can prepare at home in less than 30 minutes. And HelloFresh is giving our Canadian checkers 50% off their first order. Go to HelloFresh.ca and use promo code REALITY50 to get 50% off your first order. That's HelloFresh.ca, promo code REALITY50. This episode of The Reality Check is brought to you by FreshBooks. FreshBooks is a ridiculously easy-to-use cloud accounting software for small business owners that saves you time and gets you paid faster. Now used by over 10 million people worldwide. For your free 30-day trial, go to freshbooks.com slash the reality check and enter reality check in the how did you hear about us section. This is your reality check. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. This show was recorded on October 30th, 2017, and I'm your host, Darren McKee. With me, as usual, are Adam Gardner. What's up, Cuboids? Christina Roach. Hello. And producer Pat. Still sec, producer Pat says hi. We have a great show for you today. We have part two of our interview with Dr. David Stukas, who is a pediatric allergy and asthma specialist at Nationwide Children's Hospital. But first... I'm going to look into the Warren Buffett challenge. We don't talk about financial issues too much on the show, so I wanted to talk about a bet and what it means for investments with minor comments about biases and the news. Mm -hmm. Now, for some context, many people think hedge funds are great at providing high returns. Hmm. Many other people think that it's very hard to beat the market. In general, because the fees hedge funds charge to their investors reduce an investor's return, and active stock picking doesn't work for most people. Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world and one of the best investors, falls into the latter category of people thinking it's very hard to beat the market. Hmm. In fact, Buffett believes so strongly that about 10 years ago, he challenged the hedge fund industry that a portfolio of hedge funds couldn't beat the S&P 500 index fund over a 10-year period. For a bit of clarity, the S&P 500 index is a sample of 500 large companies. And the idea of an index fund is you track the entire performance of all the companies put together. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to investing in one company, it's like you're investing in all 500 in the index itself. Planet Money has talked about this. Freakonomics did a segment on it as well. So if I can go invest, I can say, I want to invest in an S&P 500 and I'll get sort of a a, a sample that's going to closely follow the market. Well, yes, because the S&P closely follows the market because it has a lot of large companies. But you can invest in the Toronto Stock Exchange Index, the Tokyo Index. There's many, many different types of index funds or exchange-traded funds. This is what accounts for a large portion of investing. And Mm -hmm. the basic logic is while companies go up and down and the market does go up and down, if the market goes to zero, you have greater problems. (laughs) <laughs> Meaning yes. the money in your bank account probably isn't worth much anymore either. Right. That's what so, I always say to myself about my pension. If if the government of Canada isn't around to give me my pension anymore, I have greater problems than what's going on with right. my pension. So I'm risk averse. The idea of investing in particular companies wasn't as appealing, but index funds as a whole pretty much track the market and it's hard to beat them. Yeah. So the prize Buffett was considering was $1 million. You know, for a billionaire, it's not much, but you know, it's just, uh, exactly, just to keep it interesting, proportionally, it's actually not that much money. If you have 50 billion in the bank, betting a million dollars is like having 50 grand in the bank and betting a dollar. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I don't even have that. Exactly. And just today, Bezos briefly passed Microsoft's Bill Gates for $88 billion or something as world's richest man. Anyway, as Buffett said in a letter to his shareholders, after the challenge was issued, there was mainly silence. All those hedge fund managers talking big game, but no one actually stepped up, except for one person. Ted Cetus, co-manager of Protégé Partners, LLC, and he selected five hedge funds with the fund names kept private. Note, these five actually invested in more than 100 hedge funds themselves to diversify the investment so that a single manager couldn't inadvertently tank things. They're trying to be a bit cautious as well as private about it for obvious reasons. As CNBC reported in August, the 10-year challenge began January 1st, 2008, so it has until December 31st, 2017, to finish. Mm -hmm. Using the info in Buffett's letter, CNBC said, quote, The hedge fund portfolio is up just 22% over nine years. That's slightly better than 2.2% per year. How did the S&P index fund do? Oh, just a smidgen better, up 85.4% or 7.1% per year on average. So that was seven, basically, versus two. The results by fund are even more startling, and they give you a eight-year span of the cumulative returns of the funds. Fund A, about 9%. Fund B, 28%. Fund C, 62%. Fund D, 3%. Fund E, 7%. Hedge fund average was 22%. 
index fund, 85%. Three of the funds have average annual returns of less than 1%. Because the numbers I just gave you were over the whole eight years, mm -hmm. which is pretty terrible. Yeah. Put another way, through 2016, these five funds of funds delivered an average of only 2.2% compounded annually. That means 1 million invested in those funds would have gained 220 grand. The index fund would meanwhile have gained $854,000. Buffett describes how all these managers would be highly incentivized to do as well as they could. But even with the dismal performance, they still get paid. Mm -hmm. Thus, the problem with fees. An average person with passive investing, meaning you just invest in an index fund and let it do what it does, could have gotten a much better return and no fees. Mm -hmm. Quoting Buffett, Over the years, I've often been asked for investment advice, and in the process of answering, I've learned a good deal about human behavior. My regular recommendation has been a low-cost S&P 500 index fund. To their credit, my friends who possess only modest means have usually followed my suggestion. I believe, however, that none of the mega-rich individuals, institutions, or pension funds has followed the same advice when I've given it to them. Instead, these investors politely thank me for my thoughts and depart to listen to the siren song of the high-fee manager or, in the case of many institutions, to seek out another breed of hyper-helper called a consultant. Wow, I'd be listening to his advice, who has nothing to gain um, over these other guys. Hmm. Right. To be fair, I do link to an article by Ted Cedes where he acknowledges he has lost, unless the entire market collapses, but provides some reasons why this might have been unique. He says the S&P 500 did atypically well, so things might not have been the same if a different index fund was picked. Mm -hmm. He also says it's a bit like comparing apples and oranges as hedge funds are so different. To that, I would say the whole point was to make money. <laughs> Buffett didn't choose the hedge funds to achieve that goal. Cedes did. I'll leave it to the interested listeners to explore further. You can find that at trcpodcast.com. Great website. As I mentioned, Freakonomics did a great podcast about index investing, which is linked in our show notes. Jack Bogle, the main proponent in the past decades of passive index investing for the general population, gets a shout out from Buffett. Quote, in his early years, Jack was frequently mocked by the investment management industry. Today, however, he has the satisfaction of knowing that he helped millions of investors realize far better returns on their savings than they otherwise would have earned. He is a hero to them and to me. Now, I wanted to present this story because I think far too many people are paying hedge funds and other firms to invest their money when they could easily do most of it themselves. It's hard to believe, but yes, thousands and thousands of people with their degrees and their expertise can't do a better job than many index funds that have low fees. Hmm. I should mention that Warren Buffett has managed to beat the market for decades. While this could be survivorship bias, I think it is more likely he's just really good at this particular task. Buffett says he can think of only 10 people in the world who would trust to beat the market. That said, he has indicated that when he dies, his family should put all his wealth into index funds. Mm. Huh. Two more things. Steve Tepper at CNBC again, describing the bet structure. Not content to make it a simple bet. Just put up half a million dollars each and make it a winner-take-all bet for the million. The two parties agreed to put up a smaller amount and invest the money in zero-coupon treasury bonds with the intent of growing the investment to a million dollars by the end of year 10. So they're starting at a number less than a million, which over 10 years should at least reach a million. The amount was calculated to be $640,000, so Buffett and Protégé each put up three hundred twenty grand into the account nine years ago. It didn't take until the end of 2017 for the account to grow to one million. <laughs> Interest rates plunged in 2008-2009, sending the value of the bonds way up, and the account reached $1 million in 2012. Currently, there's more than $1.8 in the account, or about triple what was invested. That's much better performance than either Protégé's fund portfolio or the index fund. <laughs> it's wow. kind of funny. Yeah, it is. Finally... Various news outlets reported this in early September, starting with the New York Post, and then others picked it up, and that's when I saw it. But they are quoting CD's Bloomberg piece that he wrote months before September. It doesn't seem like there is new information in the past few months, yet it seems like it's news. Yeah. It can be useful to reflect on how new news is, and what information is even valuable enough to be considered news. Mm -hmm. Something happened this summer, someone just thought, I'll write it about again in September, and then it seemed like it just happened in September. It's one of those things that I've learned that anytime you see an article posted, check the date. Always check the date. And check sometimes the there's date. sites that don't have a date, which they're usually not reputable. And now part two with our interview with Dr. David Stukas. Well, milk is another allergy that several people wrote in about. 
Kara mentioned that her child reacted with anaphylaxis when fed yogurt at seven months. She mentioned her son was breastfed exclusively except for a short period when she was in the hospital shortly after the birth. And essentially, she's asking if there's a link between feeding strategies, breastfeeding versus formula, in the development of a milk allergy. Um, she actually asked if her son's allergy is her fault for not picking the right feeding strategy. What do you say about that? Well, I say that if there's anybody, especially a healthcare professional or otherwise, that ever suggested to her that it was her fault in any way, shape, or form, that they have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. There are too many parents that are that are just filled with guilt that they did something that caused this, and that's just not the case at all. Um, there are very limited data that um, would support use of hypoallergenic formulas or exclusive breastfeeding in the prevention of milk allergy or other allergies. We always want to recommend breastfeeding if possible, but of course, it's not always possible for all mothers, and we don't want them to be guilty over that. But if they can, it provides many benefits. Um, but really, there's there's no great evidence that supports anything mom did in regards to feeding her own diet, uh, diet during pregnancy or what she was eating during breastfeeding or what type of formula was given that would certainly create an allergy or necessarily prevent it either. So um, the truth of the matter is that some kids are programmed to become allergic, uh, whereas others are not. And it probably has a link with timing of introduction in some ways, but there are many other factors that go into this. Um, So I would try to alleviate her guilt as much as possible. Now, Beth also asked about milk allergies and asked if you can tell us anything about the theory that milk allergic children who also have asthma are unlikely to outgrow their allergy. Yeah, that's an interesting theory, which I have not heard until now. Um, so <laughs> it's quite possible that <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I'm, it's possible I'm just in the dark and uh, I'm unaware of this link. But the, as I think about it, you could certainly hypothesize that somebody who has asthma, um, they have um, sort of declared themselves as being more on the allergic predisposition. And they probably had eczema as an infant, plus milk allergy, and then environmental allergies and asthma. So there would be more if you will, highly allergic compared to somebody who doesn't have asthma. Um, But I can, you know, anecdotally, I can tell you from clinical experience uh, that um, there are some kids that tend to hold on to their milk allergy longer than others, but I don't think that asthma by itself is a specific risk factor for that. Other people wrote in about how allergies can change over time. Andrew wrote about a young adult who had a violent allergy to sesame as a child, but can eat limited quantities as a young adult. Frequent guest on our show, astronomer Dr. Stuart Robbins asked, why can you develop allergies later in life? And this is something I wonder about as well, Mm -hmm. because I've developed seasonal allergies as sort of a middle-aged adult. So how and why do allergies change as one ages? Yeah, so they can change both ways. Uh, We know for a fact that there are many children with food allergies and even environmental allergies that sort of outgrow them or develop tolerance as they get older. Uh, That's the expectation for young infants who have milk, egg, wheat, and soy allergy. Whereas, unfortunately, only about 20% of, of kids with peanut, tree nut, and seafood allergy will develop tolerance as they get older. So they, those tend to be more lifelong. On the flip side, yes, adults can develop new food allergies, environmental allergies at any age. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really understand why. Um, this is a, a huge void um, in, in, the, in our understanding of the pathophysiology and the mechanisms behind this. We just don't have a great understanding of it. Um, it certainly can occur. Uh, the other thing that I would mention is that as we as we age, we tend to develop a lot of symptoms that may overlap with allergies. So that's why it's really important to make sure you have the right diagnosis. Um, as our, especially when we're talking about the respiratory tract and our noses, uh, the mucous membranes just change dramatically as we get older. Uh, there can be a lot of influences, both from occupational exposure and hormonal influences, and just life in general. And if you're having chronic nasal congestion or runny nose, it, there may be other causes um, aside from allergies. So having the right diagnosis can be really helpful. Hi all, producer Pat here. We'll get back to the show in a second, but first a few words about our sponsors. We've used HelloFresh a few times now, and it really is pretty cool. A box shows up at your front door with step-by-step instructions and exactly the right amount of ingredients. There's no waste, just delicious meals. They do all the planning and shopping, you do the cooking. If you want to give it a try, HelloFresh is giving our Canadian checkers 50% off their first order. Go to hellofresh.ca and use the promo code REALITY50. Hey checkers, if you're a freelancer or small business owner like me, you know how much accounting can suck up valuable time. FreshBooks makes ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software that simplifies things like invoicing, tracking expenses, and receiving payments online. You can even take photos of receipts on your phone using FreshBooks mobile apps to make claiming expenses easier. 
Right now, you can try a 30-day unrestricted free trial with no credit card required by going to freshbooks.com forward slash reality check and typing reality check in the how did you hear about us section. All right, back to Michelle. Now, uh, I wouldn't have you on the show and not ask about gluten because it is one of my pet peeves. (laughs) My understanding is that a small percentage of the population, I've seen 1%, has celiac disease, and there's also a very small percentage of people who are allergic to wheat. This doesn't seem to account for the huge supply and demand of gluten-free products in recent years. So what do you think is going on here, and is gluten sensitivity really a thing? Uh, Okay, so (laughs) I'm glad you brought this up. Roll up the sleeves. Yeah, um, so you're absolutely right. The celiac disease is an autoimmune condition where people, if they consume gluten or wheat that contains gluten, then their body literally attacks itself and they can have terrible symptoms. Uh, When you're properly diagnosed and if you can successfully avoid gluten, then you're essentially cured. Um, And so those people do great once they're diagnosed and they can avoid gluten. It still has challenges, of course. If you have a wheat allergy, um, then consumption of gluten will cause immediate onset hives or swelling, difficulty breathing or anaphylaxis, but that's going to be about less than 1% of the population as well. So a very um, small minority of the population has true medical reasons to avoid gluten. Now we have the diagnosis of gluten sensitivity. Well, this is an interesting diagnosis that's really been more relevant over the last, say, five to 10 years, where we didn't really recognize it before then. And this is when people would complain of chronic gastrointestinal complaints. So um, abdominal pain, bloating, cramping, diarrhea, constipation, things like that. And then uh, the removal of gluten from their diet, um, you know, reportedly will make their symptoms better. Here's the catch. There are no tests available to diagnose that condition. So you don't see anything on biopsy of the gastrointestinal tract. There's no blood test available. There's no food sensitivity testing that's validated or reliable in that diagnosis. So there's a lot of people out there that are either being diagnosed by a physician or self-diagnosing as having this condition who probably do not. And when it comes to the the gluten-free, you know, fad is really what it is, is it's truly more of a marketing campaign than anything. Um, where you have, you know, millions of people avoiding gluten because of what they're, you know, reading online, uh, they're, what they're getting from advertisers or what they're hearing from celebrities. Right. Um, and they, they sort of get these placebo effects where, you know, if you avoid certain amount of gluten for a certain period of time, then you feel better. And here's where I'm going to go up on my soapbox since you got me going here is <laughs> <laughs> if you look at... Please do. <laughs> so there are people out there that, yes, they have difficulty digesting gluten. If they avoid it, they feel better. But what people have done is they've now extrapolated that and they say, oh, well, do you have any chronic symptoms whatsoever? Because if you do, it may be due to gluten. Do you have dry skin? Do you have acne? Do you have what they quote unquote brain fog or memory loss or sexual dysfunction or, you know, shortness of breath, whatever it may be. And they say, ah, you may have a gluten sensitivity. And then what they do is they try to peddle their non-validated expensive tests. And I use air quotes when I say that. And then they diagnose them as having such. And then you have to spend even more money to buy the more expensive gluten-free products, which aren't going to provide any benefit in the first place, and you're back to square one before you know it. And that's what happens when you get me going about gluten. <laughs> well, you, you make an interesting point about invalid tests. Is that a fairly common thing that people are testing for allergies or sensitivities with non-validated methods? It is an epidemic of misinformation, and it is rampant in our society. It is, uh, it's a big problem. Wow. And uh, people are being targeted. Um, and, um, you know, we see this. It's, it's a variation of snake oil that we've seen throughout the years. And it's just it's this decade's flavor. There are at-home tests available. There's, there are people that are touting, you know, hair and urine analysis. There's people doing muscle provocation testing. There's people doing um, all kinds of these, you know, pseudoscientific tests out there that uh, really don't have any evidence to support their use. And people are paying their hard-earned money and not getting, you know, the help that they need. So, yeah, I would, I would characterize it as a big problem. Yeah, Adam did a, a pretty good overview of applied kinesiology a few episodes ago and touched upon that. And it's, it's just sad that so many people are, are, are falling for this and, and spending money and, and worrying about things that are, are not, that are essentially bogus. Yes. And, uh, I agree. I, it's just, you know, there's a lot that goes into it and I'd, I would love if you're interested to come back sometime and talk about some of the, the thoughts that go into that. I know you guys do a great job of, of delving into those issues, but, um, it's a real problem. Well, so I want to jump to flu season because it's upon us again. And as usual, most people are recommended to get a flu vaccine. Some people are afraid because they believe that it can give them the flu. Other people claim to be allergic and cite things like egg allergies. 
in your opinion, are these valid concerns? Uh, no. Um, so, I'll, but I'll explain. The, the flu vaccine, now we used to use a nasal mist that had a live virus, but that's no longer available. So the injected flu vaccine contains an inactivated portion of the flu virus. It's a piece of protein. It does not cause illness. It does not cause infection. What your immune system does is it recognizes a specific piece of the protein. And then if you actually encounter the flu virus in real life during that season, then your body would have already mounted an effective immune response and can help fight it off. So it simply does not cause the flu. It cannot do it, literally cannot do it. Now, in regards to allergic reactions, the vast majority of suspected allergic reactions to vaccines in general, including the flu vaccine, aren't due to true allergy. You can have side effects sometimes. A lot of people will have what we call a vagal response just from any needle exposure where they feel very flushed and hot and even faint and, um, mm-hmm. and you know, get uh, very queasy at the at injections and things like that. That's a very common one. Or the more common reactions would be just soreness. And that's just the immune response because as your antibodies go where the injection occurred, you're going to get some inflammation and some irritation and soreness that generally lasts a couple of days. Some people can even have mild fever with it. When it comes to allergy, we, you know, influenza along with yellow fever and rabies vaccines are prepared using chick um, uh, embryos. So we used to think that this could potentially introduce egg protein into the vaccine. And we used to say avoid influenza vaccine if you have an egg allergy. Well, in 2009, the H1N1 flu pandemic hit, and we said, uh-oh, we have to try to vaccinate all of these you know, egg allergic individuals because you know, they can get seriously ill from this. And since then, there's been over 45 published clinical trials that have all shown the same thing. The influenza vaccine is absolutely safe for anybody with a history of egg allergy, regardless of their severity, even those who have anaphylaxis to egg. It turns out that most of the vaccines probably don't have any egg protein in it, or if there is any egg protein, it's just not enough to cause an allergic reaction or it's altered in such a way. Right. Yeah. yeah, so there's a long and short on, on those two uh, common questions that I receive. Yeah, yet that one's still floating around, isn't it? Especially the egg allergy one. Oh, yes, yeah. So it, you mentioned before about the campaign to try to undo misconceptions. That's something we've been working on for the last four to five years. And I still get, you know, I get calls from pediatricians about that at least once a month. And here's another one. We used to think that MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, was contraindicating people with egg allergy. This was disproven 40 years ago. And once a year, I still get consults saying, I don't want to give the MMR to somebody with an egg allergy. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe he's already answered my next question. We wanted to ask you lastly about myths related to allergies. In your experience, what is the most prevalent myth about allergies and which myth really grinds your gears? Uh, well, there's, there's a lot to choose from. I think the biggest one is the self-diagnosis of allergy. Um, there's been some great studies that show, you know, survey data. Hey, raise your hand. Who has a food allergy? 30% of people will say, I have a food allergy. But if you actually look at the data, it's about 5 to 6% of people that actually have it. So if you just go by self-reports or if you just go by testing alone, most people are being misdiagnosed or overdiagnosed. Right. And that leads to unnecessary food elimination and avoidance and hardships and things like that. So that's, that's, a, that's a big problem and a common myth. The one that really um, cracks me up more than anything is all the families that come to me and say, oh, it's okay, I have a hypoallergenic pet. Well, oh. <laughs> there's really no true hypoallergenic pet. All, all cats and dogs especially will release their dander and allergens into the air, which comes from their sweat glands and saliva and urine, um, and anybody can react to them. Some of them may cause more symptoms than others, especially when it comes to dogs and certain breeds. Um, but, you know, there's this marketing campaign, and some companies in the past have even marketed their $20,000 genetically engineered hypoallergenic cats that, you know, were hairless wow. and things like that. And the um, fact of the matter is... Um, you know, if you have pet allergy, you may have more or less symptoms around certain animals, but there's just no such breed or animal that's just, you know, hypoallergenic. I guess the Labradoodles and Golden Doodles just have a good publicist. Well, it didn't. Well, they had the President Obama and his family who got one because of his daughter. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's True. pretty good publicity for that. <laughs> Now, one more thing. I have a burning question from uh, my girlfriend. Mm. How do I fix my allergy to red wine? Oh. <laughs> any, any advice? Uh, so that's a tough one. Now, true allergy to alcohol and red wine and things like that is pretty darn rare. I'm not saying it's not possible, but there are other reactions that people can have. Um, a lot of these beverages will contain sulfites. 
And there's a percentage of the population that has difficulty um, metabolizing the sulfites, especially if they have asthma. And it can cause, you know, pretty severe respiratory symptoms. It feels like an allergy. It looks like an allergy. You have to avoid it because you have symptoms, but it's not technically an allergy because you want to have anaphylaxis, things like that. Um, and then it also it could be, depending upon what our symptoms are, and we won't get into that because you know, it's private information, but there are other sort of adverse effects and side effects from red wine, specifically like some people are more prone to getting very bad headaches from some of the tannins and other products. So I, my, my advice would be, uh, well, one, I would hate that anybody would have to go through life avoiding such goodness as red wine. Um, <laughs> but, you know, two, talk to a doc and try to figure this out or meet with an allergist perhaps and you know, try to tease this out because there may be a specific component. And um, I would just be very curious to know is it certain grapes or certain types or certain brands or things like that. So where can people find you? Well, uh, I'm most um, available on Twitter at AllergyKidsDoc. Um, that's probably the best place. And, um, you know, I, I spend my time trying to dispel misconceptions and myths and providing um, vetted resources for evidence-based information. But I interact with folks all the time as well. So I can't answer specific um, inquiries about people's medical, you know, history and, and treatment and things like that. But sometimes I can direct you to, um, you know, some good resources about information that may pertain to you. So uh, if people are looking, I, I would love for people to hit me up on Twitter and uh, interact with me that way. Dr. Stukas, uh, thank you very much. We know that you're a very busy guy. Thank you for taking some time to talk to us this morning. Um, we hope that we can entice you to come back sometime. Oh, I would love that. Thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun chatting with you today. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us once again, listeners. I showed you that index investing is probably the way to go, and Warren Buffett kind of proved it in public against the hedge funds. And we had another great interview with Dr. Stukas, and we want to thank him once again for coming on the show and providing some answers to our listeners' questions. Until next time, think better to act better. Peace out, cuboids. Stay classy, not smartassy. Good night, everyone. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. Mm-hmm.